This is Colette Norval Lewis. I'm National Program Chair for NCNW. On behalf of Ingrid Saunders Jones, National Chair, and Janice Mathis, our Executive Director, I welcome you to NCNW's monthly Millennial Entrepreneurs Webinar Series. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We present these programs each month as a part of our Four for the Future program thrust. We focus on STEAM education, eliminating health disparities, entrepreneurship, and civic engagement. If you're not a member of NCNW, we hope that you will join us. Uh, you can join us at ncnw.org. Our 58th National Convention will be held November 9th through 11th in Washington, D.C., and it promises to be very exciting. So you want to be a member and you want to be there with us. We encourage you again to visit our website, ncnw.org, and register and plan to attend the convention. Some of you have already signed up for the Me Pitch competition, which will be Friday, November 9th, uh, at the convention. This is going to be a Shark Tank type event for new and emerging businesses with a very substantial uh, prize. So we hope that if you have a new and emerging business, you will sign up very soon. The last day is October 1st. You can again uh, sign up on our website, ncnw.org. Uh, we hope that your business idea will be the winning one. And now I'd like to introduce our uh, moderator, Celeste McCall. Celeste is a member of the Bar of the State of New York and a graduate of the University of Miami School of Law, where she earned a JD in May of 2016 and went on to earn a Master of Laws degree in Entertainment, Arts, and Sports Law in December of 2016. While in law school, Ms. McCall was a member of the Society of Bar and Gavel and the Intellectual Property Law Society. She also clerked for Law Innocence. Ms. McCaw joined NCNW in June of this year after working as an associate at the New York law firm Aronson, Rappaport, Feinstein, and Dirch. And Celeste has been doing a wonderful job for us, and I want to thank her for all of her contributions to NCNW and to this series. So good morning, everyone. Um, I would first like to say thank you so much to Ms. Paulette Norvell Lewis for that awesome introduction. And I want to welcome everyone again to this morning's Millennial Entrepreneurs Webinar, Email Writing Strategies. We have the amazing Dave Schools with us this morning as our guest speaker. Dave is the founding editor of Entrepreneurs Handbook, a medium.com publication with over 70,000 followers that is dedicated to helping entrepreneurs succeed. As a messaging consultant for startups, and as a freelance writer, his writing has been published in Inc. Magazine, Forbes, Axios, CNBC, Business Insider, Quartz, Thought Catalog, and more. He interviews entrepreneurs, including Damon John from Shark Tank, the CEO of Jersey Mike Subs, and the CEO of Orange Theory Fitness. Dave is the CEO of Party Cues Inc., a fast-growing conversation starter app with thousands of monthly users and the author of the novel, Runaway Millionaire. Originally from New York, Dave graduated with a degree in entrepreneurship from Grove City College in 2012 and married his college sweetheart, Stephanie. Together, they travel around the country with their two cats and a newborn on the way. So first, congratulations, Dave, to you and your wife for that new blessing that will be added to your family. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. Very excited to be here. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yep, I'm going to be a new dad coming yeah. in February. That's awesome. Congrats. Thank you. All right, let's get started. Uh, I'm excited to be here and to share some lessons about how to write strategic emails and tactics. Um, so here's a little snapshot of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to share with you the goal of this entire presentation, kind of what you'll get out of it. I'll share a little bit about my story. Uh, then we'll, we'll talk through the problem that we're going to solve. 
and then four writing strategies that will solve that problem. Then we'll take it down to a more granular level and get tactical uh, when it comes to executing and crafting strategic emails. Um, we'll also be stopping for questions along the way. And then we'll end with a kind of a lightning round of five quick tips for better team emails. Okay, cool. So the goal of this presentation is to increase sales conversions. We're all entrepreneurs here. We're small business owners. Revenue is important. Email helps drive sales. And so ideally by the end of this presentation, you will be better equipped to close more sales through email. Also, communication can be a, a big problem area in business and things can be misinterpreted through email. So we're going to talk about how to craft more uh, clearer emails. And then hopefully we'll share a few chuckles along the way. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, The Office, but it's one of my favorite shows. So I've incorporated some lessons and themes from The Office. So moving right along, we've touched on the goal. And now I want to share a little bit about me, kind of why I'm passionate, why uh, why I'm talking about writing emails and uh, give you a little bit more about my background. So, who this? I am, first of all, foremostly a writer, big word nerd, love writing. I've kept a journal since I was nine years old. In fact, one of the first journal entries ever that I've ever written was a prayer from my brother's mouse whose back legs were broken and it was a prayer for healing. So I've just been journaling for years now, um, big word nerd, and I've been published in, in all sorts of different publications, a lot of which the opportunity to write for publications, like what you see on the screen, comes from the ability to pitch in emails. And so at the end of this, this presentation, you'll kind of have an idea of how to pitch a publication and potentially get published in a publication like this. I've also created courses on how to get published as a writer. If that's something you're interested in, uh, look me up. You'll be able to find my writing revenue course on Udemy and also my medium writing course. So as a writer, I've been fortunate and blessed enough to interview some pretty interesting people such as Damon John, uh, one of the investors on the popular Shark Tank show. And it was a privilege to talk with Damon for half an hour about franchising. Really just a fascinating conversation. He's he's such a professional and funny and, and warm guy. Uh, it was really an honor to talk with him and write his story for Inc. Magazine. I also, one story about a, a piece that went viral was I, I wrote something on LinkedIn and I'd encourage anyone who's watching this presentation to be writing on LinkedIn. There's all sorts of opportunities that can come from being active on the LinkedIn platform. Um, but I wrote, I wrote one story that received over 2 million views and this is kind of a, uh, a picture that I took and posted on Instagram as this post was on its way up. And this story ended up being republished on CNBC, make it. So um, just a cool experience uh, as a writer uh, that, that I've been blessed with. I'm also an editor and the, I'm the editor of Entrepreneur's Handbook on Medium. If you all have not heard of Medium, I really encourage you to check out that platform. Great place, not only to write, in my opinion, it's the most beautiful place to write on the internet, um, but also a great, great place to read. Uh, interesting, deeper ideas, kind of like what's happening behind the news or evergreen content that will teach you some interesting skills. So Entrepreneur's Handbook, I, I publish, it's a publication dedicated to helping entrepreneurs succeed, inspiring stories combined with practical takeaways. That's my secret formula as an editor. I'm also the CQO and that title does not stand for what you might think it might stand for. This is my wife and it stands for Chief Question Officer. I'm the Chief Question Officer of Party Cues, the conversation starter app. It's, it's the simplest app you'll ever open. It's just questions for date nights and small groups. 
uh, on a mission to help folks who struggle with social anxiety replace awkward silences with interesting conversations. Free app, check it out. Um, that's, that's one of the things that I do as well. These are some of the taglines uh, that I, I've printed with party cues to kind of share around coffee shops. So just, I have fun with it. It has uh, 6,000 monthly active users and it started to monetize. These are some examples of, the, of party cues questions. What combination of interests make you unique? Stuff like that. Um, so feel free to check out party cues. I'm also an author. If, if, you're, if you're not getting the impression that I, that I don't do a lot of things, when people ask me what I do, it's a complicated answer. I, I, don't, I normally say I do seven different things and then try to list them within 30 seconds. But I'm also an author. Runaway Millionaire is a modern day t retelling of the parable of the prodigal son. Um, if that interests you, it's on Amazon uh, for purchase. Wrote that book in an hour, in a, I almost said hour and a half, in about two, in a year and a half. Um, my wife and I have been traveling around every three months as nomads, so I fall into that digital nomad bucket um, at one point, and we, we've we gave away, we used to live in Washington, D.C. We gave away 66% of what we owned every, and bought a CRV. And all, all everything we own fits into that CRV, including our two cats. And earlier this year, we drove 55 hours straight from one end of the country to the other. So life is full of adventures. But that's a little bit about me. And if I were to kind of boil everything down as to what I do, I create and I sell mostly with words and writing. And this presentation is going to focus more on the selling part as, uh, as we talk about emails. So that's a little bit about me, that's some background. Um, now let's talk about the problem. Why, why are we all here? Again, this is the goal, increase sales conversions, communicate better. Uh, and we're, I'm just gonna focus these goals a little bit more into the context of emails. So we're obviously not gonna be laughing through email. Hopefully that will be together in person over this webinar, but let's talk about the problem. So in today's world of social media, instant messaging and mobile, social media is everywhere. We're probably all on one or two platforms. Instant messaging like uh, Slack, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, there's all sorts of different ways to communicate. And now we can do it all from our mobile devices. Does email even matter? Email has been around for years and years and years. Is it something that we should be focusing on at this point or should we move on? So I wanted to put this in context a little bit and show you that in so far this year, there's, been, there's about 2.2 billion users of Facebook worldwide. Big number, right? That's two-sevenths of the world's population. Almost everybody's on Facebook, it seems. So a lot of people, right? Let's focus on Facebook, let's forget about email. Not quite. That's not true because email has 3.8 billion users worldwide. And to give, to show you kind of a graph, to depict that visually, email is almost double the size of Facebook. That means email is extremely important and the point i want to make is that business is built on email email is not going anywhere 281 billion emails are sent per day worldwide which is astounding like that's a number that's hard to contemplate but the point is is that email is extremely important and that's why we're talking about it today now let's talk about the cost of using email poorly. There was one study called, um, that was published at the Society for Human Resource Management.com. The study, the cost of poor communications, put that the annual cost for poor communications for companies with 100 employees was $420,000 a year. So it's important to get email right and to write emails as best as we can because poor communication does have, does affect the bottom line. Okay. Another interesting statistic related to communication is 62% of people do not like their jobs due to communication issues. 
And so email can affect how you feel about your work. If you don't enjoy, if you get poor emails over and over again from coworkers, from customers, that's gonna affect how you feel about your job and that's that can be a serious problem. And it's affecting 62% of people who don't like their jobs. So it's important to be able to write emails well. If I were to articulate the problem into three main ideas, we're talking about ineffective communication, lack of communication, and miscommunication, whether it's not enough, whether it's unclear, or if it's misinterpreted. These are the problems that we want to avoid in the emails we're going to write. So let's talk about how to do that. We're going to talk about four writing strategies now, and then after this segment, we'll stop for questions. Sound good? All right, strategy number one, and this is foundational and extremely important, not only in email, but in how you communicate in person, uh, on social media, numerous benefits to this first strategy. And a way to kind of frame it is something that Dr. Frank Luntz put in his book, Words That Work. He said, it's not what you say, it's what they hear. And, and Dr. Luntz, just so you know, he was the um, chief communication advisor for a number of US presidents, corporate CEOs. And so he's, he's had a lot of experience with crafting messaging. And one thing that he's found through many different focus groups is that it's not, it's not what you say, it's what your audience hears. And now how do we, if we were to apply this to email, um, you can write an email and put, put words down on the screen and send it over to someone, meaning one thing in your head, and then when it's received on the other end, it could mean something completely different. And so that's, this, this is the, the uh, strategy that I want to address here. How do you align the words that you put into an email to mean the same thing to the, the person who's receiving that email? And to kind of illustrate, this principle, principle of it's not, it's not what you say, it's what they hear. I want to jump out to a quick clip of The Office and play it for you um, to show this. And uh, I should probably set some context for this episode because it's... Show business is cold. Let's say you get a job, which you... So Daryl, and I, I, I trust that many of you have seen The Office, Andy Bernard is quitting his job to jump into a career as a show businessman, as an actor. Daryl, his caring friend, walks into his office to give him sage advice about why he might want to reconsider and rethink this career path. And so he walks into his office and says this to Andy. You probably won't. They're not going to cut you any slack. You meant for a job with lots and lots of slack. All right. I get it. The male is a funny species. We don't just tell each other how we feel. That's chick stuff. So instead of saying, hey, Andy, I love you, man. I don't want you to leave. You say something like, hey, Andy, you're making the worst mistake of your life. You're not talented. Well, right back at you, Daryl. I'm going to miss you, too. <laughs> and he's from... <laughs> okay, so what's happened in this, in this setting? It is a classic case of saying one thing and it being completely misinterpreted by the other party. So Daryl said, I just think you're going to this too, a little too fast. Show business is cold. Let's say you get a job, which you probably won't. They're not going to cut you any slack. And you're meant for a job with lots and lots of slack. What Andy heard, as he eloquently explained, was, I miss you, Andy. And so he goes up to Daryl and says, I, I miss you too. And just kind of completely missing the message that Daryl is trying to get through to him. 
this happens in email all the time. People receive your words differently from how you intend them to mean initially. So how do we best align those two things? Uh, Andy, this happened, this problem that we just kind of watched in Netflix happens a little, a little too frequently with Andy Bernard's character. So, um, so you may be thinking, all right, if I'm trying to communicate a message to someone in their mind such that they, they get exactly what I want to say, well, you know, I can't do that. I'm not a mind reader. Uh, and this is where writing becomes telepathy. Stephen King said, Stephen King, the, the famous novelist, uh, world-renowned author, he has a, a great memoir on what it's like to be a writer and how to write called On Writing, highly recommend it. But he said, all the arts depend upon telepathy to some degree, but I believe that writing is the purest distillation. An important element of writing is transference. Your job isn't to write words on the page, but rather to transfer the ideas inside your head into the heads of your readers. Words are just the medium through which the transfer happens. So that's that's our goal here. When writing an email, how do you transfer, transfer the idea from your head to the person reading your email's head? Here's the strategy. Self-awareness. Self-awareness has been cited by numerous big time CEOs and entrepreneurs as the most beneficial attribute and char characteristic to have uh, professionally. Gary V, he's, he cites self-awareness and gratitude as the two traits that he would proliferate and want everyone in the world to have. Um, so let's, let's, I wanna give you a specific example of an email um, that someone sent to a customer. So this employee received an email from a customer who was asking questions about how the company worked. The employee responded, these are great questions, but unfortunately there are limits to how much I can answer. From the employee's perspective, that's a valid, true statement. He's not the owner of the business. This was the, the uh, someone who was manning the desk at an escape room business. And so he, he's not the owner of the whole company. He doesn't know everything, uh, doesn't know how to, how to accurately answer every single question the customer has. And so he responds, these are great questions, but unfortunately there are limits to how much I can answer. What, the, what is this really saying to the person who receives that email? Well, they might hear it, it, they, they might, it might sound like, I don't really wanna help you. Like it could, it could be misinterpreted that way. And so how do we, how do we avoid that miscommunication? Perhaps a response like this, great questions, I'm not sure, but let me find out. Can I get back to you in an hour? Instead of what was said before, this may now come across as I truly care about you. And being honest, I don't know the answer. These are great questions. Can I get back to you in an hour? It's a much more active, affirmative, affirmative, honest, and intentionally caring way to respond. Again, we're, we're talking at a strategic level and we're gonna get to the tactical level as far as like which words and how to use questions and even you know sentence and paragraph length. We're gonna get into those details, um, but right now we're just talking about strategies. So to really apply self-awareness in communication, ask yourself this question when writing an email before you send it. How will this person receive it? Or how will these people receive this email? Really try, self-awareness is the ability to, to go third person on yourself and to be able to see almost as objectively as possible how people are going to take the words that you are speaking and writing. So in writing emails, remember this strategy of self-awareness and ask yourself, how will this person receive this before you send it? Okay, strategy number two. Mark Twain, famous writer, as we've probably all heard of him, said, I didn't have, to, he wrote a, a letter to his cousin and he said, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so here's a long one instead. Isn't that a, it's an interesting, almost oxymoronical way to put the fact that it takes more thought and time and energy to write something that's short 
than it does to write something that is long. And it's the skill and strategy of brevity. Brevity is like following a dialed in GPS route across the country. Without it, you'd probably get lost. What is, how does this apply to email? In email, we're communicating thoughts, ideas, strategies, brainstorms, answers, where brevity is the ability to think through what you want to say and put it in the most condensed, distilled, accurate way before shooting it across the interwebs to the person who's receiving it. If you don't take the time to be brief and really think through what you want to say in the shortest way possible, you're going to send someone on a trail that looks like this road all over it's inefficient uh, waste time that you might lose them they might be inclined to not read your email next time so brevity especially in emails creates less work for other people this is it's a gift it's something that's a, a, a great practice in business um, Frederick Nietzsche uh, a philosopher prolific philosopher much smarter than than I am said it is my ambition to say in 10 sentences what others say in a whole book that is a, that's a steep ambition I don't, I don't know many people who could who could make that claim but that's the point of brevity is that somebody could take a whole book to say something but what if you could think through that like put the time getting back to Mark Twain's quote, put the time into thinking through the message of that book and then summarizing it down into its corest message. And that's kind of what we want to apply in our emails. So let's get really uh, detailed here. What is the ideal length of an email? There was a study by HubSpot in 2018 here, this, this year that the more you write, the less likely you are to get a response. Only one in three messages that are longer than 2,500 words receive a reply. However, you shouldn't be too brief. A 25 word email is roughly as effective as a 20,000, a 2,000 word one, excuse me. What's the sweet spot between 50 and 125 words or around the length of this paragraph? So this is almost a visual illustration of what the ideal length of an email is, this slide. So in writing your emails, overly short, maybe consider if it's less than 25 words, maybe ask, is this worth sending at all? And if it's an enormous email, maybe you need to do some more thinking or approach the email differently to get it into the ideal window of 50 to 125 words words. So to wrap this strategy up, brevity is the gift of efficiency. And the more efficient a business is, the more successful it will be as far as time. So ask yourself before sending your next email, is there anything I can cut out or remove from this email? That is strategy number two. Number three, so we have self-awareness and we have brevity. Strategy number three could be put by this quote from Steven Pinker, who uh, is the author of Sense of Style, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about, about him, but he said, good writing gets out of the way of the ideas. Good writing is invisible, which is a fascinating concept. And so the point here is clarity. How do we write emails that are clear? Where what you're trying to get across comes across in the way that you intended it to. That's what I mean by clarity. Now here's the thing. This is a fascinating concept. It really resonated me with me as, as a writer because I, I hated writing in school. Uh, yeah, it was just, I wasn't good at it. The, the idea of writing for an audience of one, the teacher for a letter grade didn't, didn't resonate with me. And I wasn't, wasn't very good at it because often it's formulaic writing and you're trying to fit a rubric where outside of school in the business world, writing changes the course of, of businesses, of the market, where 
my first job out of school, I was taught by my boss, Andre Wilcox, um, who's also an author and a fascinating person. She taught me how to write a press release. And a press release is what made me fall in love with writing because a press release is the pure facts. And, uh, when, and so when I wrote a press release about a small business, I worked at the, the Chamber of Commerce and I saw that the paper would receive this press release that I sent out by email and reprinted it in the newspaper. I saw, wow, writing impacts people. Like it can really move people. So academic writing struggles a little bit in the, its practicality. And here's, here's what um, Steven Pinker said. He said, academic writing stinks. And it's, it's very interesting. He said, why should a profession that dedicates itself to the transmission of knowledge so often turn out prose, words that are sturgid, soggy, wooden, bloated, clumsy, obscure, unpleasant to read, and impossible to understand? Academic writing is, is it's kind of like trying to appear smart uh, and to appear impressive rather than elicit change from that writing. And so and background in Steven Pink, Pinker being a Harvard professor, cognitive psycholinguist and author. Um, this comes from his essay, Why Academics Stink at Writing. Um, this was eye-opening to me um, in the sense that when we send emails, we don't want it to come across as academic writing. And what will help in writing an email is to kind of, you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, know are intimately acquainted with the details of your business. Like you know your business, your services, your products better than probably anyone else in the world. Maybe not some key employees, but what that what that manifests in is kind of what Pinker, Stephen Pinker calls the curse of knowledge, where you're you're speaking and communicating from a place of knowing an insane amount about your product or service. But then when you communicate to someone who knows nothing about your product or service, you can miss them and almost communicate in a way where it doesn't resonate, it goes right over their heads, or they dismiss it, or they're not interested, and, and the sale falls through. The action isn't taken as a result. So um, the curse of knowledge is a, a huge contributor to academies, academic writing, it's a difficulty in imagining what it is like for someone else not to know something that you know. So this is, it kind of gets back to that self-awareness, your ability to empathize with folks who are receiving your emails. So the point is, don't try to sound smart. Be smart. Like don't try to sound, don't try to, to sound dumb, but there's a propensity in academic writing to, to try to sound smart, like being smart for the sake of being smart. Don't do that in emails. Emails written at a third grade level. This is from a study of 40 million emails by Boomerang, which is a Google, uh, which is a Gmail plugin, uh, very cool tool. They studied 40, 40 million, million emails and assessed the reading level of each one and found that a third grade reading level is 36% more likely to get a reply than those written at a college reading level. So that kind of shows you increase your chances of having your emails responded to for action being taken. You increase that by 36%. So um, that is the strategy of clarity. And to apply this concept, ask yourself before sending your next email, is anything about this message unclear or could it be simpler? Okay, guys. Last one, and then we'll stop for questions. We've talked about self-awareness, brevity, clarity, and now this final one is pertinent to especially sales emails. Let me ask you a question. What emotion is this animal experiencing? It's a little ambiguous, I understand. Probably not the best photo to, to illustrate this point but it's supposed to be laughter and positivity and levity. So this is actually an important strategy 
and writing emails with customers. Uh, not all writing is happy, obviously. You have tragedies, Romeo and Juliet. You have, you know, writing can be a source of relating and empathizing, and that, that doesn't have to be uh, always happy. But all sales emails should be, and let's talk about why and how. Uh, a sale, when someone buys your product or service, you want them to feel good about it right? So positivity is a way to kind of grease that process and make, make your customers feel good as they work through your sales funnel. And so let's talk about how to apply that to emails. There's an interesting study done with identical twins. I found this fascinating where uh, 481 people and a, a chewing gum company sponsored this study but 481 people came into this uh, building and watched watched folks two two sets of identical twins, different setups, and were asked different questions about these twins, such as which one would you rather go on a date with? Which one is friendlier? Which one are you more likely to want to talk with? Different questions, personal questions like that. And it's very interesting, 73% of those visitors said they preferred the gum chewers. And it's important to note that the gum was the only difference between these identical twins. Everything else was exactly the same. And so the point I'm making here is how can you chew gum in your emails, right? What is that small little difference that you can incorporate into your emails that makes them more winsome? And I believe that answer is positivity. Positivity attracts people. When you chew gum, and it's, it's interesting, like, should you chew gum in an interview? No. But <laughs> if you're chewing gum, that makes you appear friendlier. That's an interesting thing to think through. But the point is, in our emails, look for the win, look for a way to turn the conversation into something positive. Because oftentimes as business owners and entrepreneurs, you know that you'll get customer feedback, employee situations where it's just a downer, you know, it's, it's, it's a negative situation. There's a complaint, something is broken. There was, you know, something fell through. So when you're writing responses to those emails, creatively brainstorm, think outside the box, offer something new and remember to show kindness to everyone always, especially in the written text. If you write something that's overly negative, like it can be, it can come across or, or, or say sarcastic and you want to be a little subtle with like poking uh, or like making a jab to get back at someone who's written a, a painful email. It comes across, harsher in an email, a cold black and white text email. So always remember to be positive in your emails. So I wanna, I wanna highlight an example, of course, from the office about how to offer something new, because I think this is a, an important, this is more on a, on a tactical level. Uh, this is a great way to turn around a negative situation. So let's watch the master. Michael Scott hears bad news from, from Phyllis. It's a pimple, Phyllis. He sighs. This is, he's, he, he receives the bad email. What, how does he respond? He says, he introduces new facts and redirects attention. He says, Avril Lavigne gets them all the time. Instead of saying like, it's a pimple, Phyllis. Ah, oh, pimples are ugly or pimples are, they just ruin things. You know, instead of kind of dwelling on the bad news, he introduces new facts. Avril Lavigne, she gets them all the time and then drives it home for the win saying, and she rocks harder than anyone else. So with those the new facts redirecting, he, he, he spins it to a positive conclusion doing that. So if you can incorporate this principle, this strategy into your emails, you will Find, find greater success. So 
application question, how can I turn this into a positive? So let's stop for questions. Those are the four strategies, kind of like high level, how do we think about writing strategic emails? Uh, these are the four strategies that I found to rec uh, that I recommend. Yeah, this that was great, actually. Brevity and clarity resonated the most with me. I was like writing, I was like, Celeste, <laughs> you need to do better. Um, so I'm gonna turn over and ask William if there are any hands raised or if there are any questions right now from the attendees. Uh, Celeste, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, uh, we do not have any questions that have been submitted, nor do we have any hands that are raised at this point. I wanna make sure that people are aware, uh, since I had technical difficulties at the beginning of the webinar, there are two ways um, to engage. Uh, one, there is a panel, uh, or pane, I should say, on your control panel that says enter a question uh, for staff where you can type a question in, you can hit send, uh, you will submit that question, I'll give it to Celeste and she can uh, engage the presenter for you. Uh, also, on the tab to the left of your control panel, uh, under the orange arrow, at the very bottom, there's a hand with an arrow in it. That's how you can raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, we will recognize you and unmute you, and you can ask your own question. So uh, please, if you have a question or a comment or would like to uh, engage with the presenter, uh, please do so. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, William. All right, so we'll move forward a bit and then we'll stop. We've got, we've got one hand up. So yeah. let's see if okay. uh, Ms. Jones. Uh, Ms. Jones, you are self muted. Um, there is a telephone handset icon. There you go. You've unmuted yourself. So go right ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, can you hear me fine? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So when we're writing the emails, because emails give me a lot of fear, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm the educated writer. So how uh, can you talk more about this, more about positivity? So when I'm talking to groups, I talk about joy. But when I'm writing, I write so formal. So what makes it um what makes the writing positive I, I heard you say not point any fingers not try to make bad jokes but it's still formal i'm an engineer too and it it's just give me the facts that help me make it lighter sure great question um in the next i'm going to ask you a question but also you may want to mute yourself uh, because we've got background noise that we can hear from your speakers. Okay, trying. Hold on. In the next section, we're going to talk about more uh, tactical, like very specific ways of, of implementing these strategies. So, so get ready for that. But um, to answer your question specifically, I would encourage you to think about using natural language because often when you hear someone speak and then you watch them write there's a discrepancy in the sense that it comes across way more unnaturally in text and so perhaps using more informal modes of communication such as uh emojis or lol or ha 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 you know like these things are fun silly and i in in today's world I would propose that it's be, it's not unprofessional to do that. Mm. It's it's almost more uh, approachable and accessible to someone, making someone feel at ease. And because if someone re receives this overly formal email, it's almost like okay, I have to meet that person at that level of formality, which is pressure, and they might not respond. But if you come across as a as a friendly, you know, emoji filled, colorful, light, you know, ha 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 ha. You know, you incorporate those that natural language. They might be more inclined to to offer uh, their response. So that's what I would say. Um, 
Any other questions? Yes, we actually, we have a question from Ms. Loretta Caldwell Thompson. She wants to know when is a personal conversation better than an email? Great question. I would say when it's a complex topic. So if it if you find yourself writing four paragraphs, five paragraphs that are taking up the page, like these huge walls of text, mm -hmm. that's when you might want to put something on the calendar to do a half hour call. Um, there are cases where you're talking about multi item, um, multi multiple items in an email and there's a way to architect the email to make, to make it clear. But if it's conflict based and it's, it's personal, yeah, don't do that in email because then you can get into a, he said, she said conflict where it's like, well, you wrote this, but people change, feelings change, but text does not. So when, it, when, it, when you find yourself writing a lot and really trying to explain a complex emotion or viewpoint, yeah, maybe, maybe do a phone call instead. Okay, great. We also have another question from Ms. Regrandia. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, Chandler. Um, she wants to know, are these four strategies applicable to nonprofits? Oftentimes nonprofits are required to email requests, grant applications, and letters of interest. So do these four strategies apply to nonprofits as well? That's a great question because, and I would point to strategy number one, with self-awareness, know who you're writing to. So if you're writing to someone who does want it to be formal, does want it to have a professional formulaic tone and feel, then yeah, yeah, you're gonna want to uh, be aware of that and then meet requirements and how you communicate accordingly. I would say that the other principles still apply, especially brevity and clarity. Um, but, but largely, it depends on who you're writing to. Sometimes, as a nonprofit, if you're doing a grant or if you're requesting a donation, if, if you write in a way that isn't like other nonprofits write, for example, informal, casual, friendly, warm, uh, not drawn out and kind of in huge sentences, like if you use short sentences, you're gonna catch the eye of the reader and perhaps stand out from the other requests for donations that they're receiving. So that would be my advice. Okay, great. We also um, have another question. Keep them coming. Oh, can I ask a quick question? Do we have a, we don't have a hard stop at 1230, do we, or do? Um, no, it's at one. At one, okay, at great. One. Okay. I'm not really sure if this is a question, but I'm going to read it. It may be more of a comment. This is from Ms. Ayana Vasquez. Um, thank you for your presentation. I had to learn about um, my bad email strategies the hard way. Now that I find that I'm no longer writing emails, but crafting them. So I don't know if there was a follow up to that, but thank you so much, Ayana, for your comment as far as like for the presentation. So apparently, Dave, you're doing great. So keep the tactics coming. So we're going to move forward. And if there are any questions or follow-ups to questions that people have already had, then maybe we want a little bit of clarification. Definitely submit those questions to William or raise your hand. Um, but we're going to move forward now. Okay. Great. Great. All right. Seven email writing tactics for sales. So guys, we're talking about how to how to make more money when it comes to emails. How do you write? the perfect, I don't want to say perfect, but a really good email that increases your chances of closing the deal, getting the meeting. Let's do it. So number one, always use the customer's name, always. The, here, and here's the reason why. Sometimes you'll get emails, of course, when you're starting the first email, um, you'll, you'll address the person by their name, say they respond, and they use your name. Do you then, because you're talking to the same person, use their name? My advice is always use the customer's name, the prospect's name, because by the time they come back to your email, they have looked at other emails, they've done other work, they've busied themselves, and so they're coming back kind of cold to the conversation, and using their name, people are drawn to their name. So if you use their name, it kind of focuses them in and shows that it's important. So 
Um, for example, uh, five emails into a thread, you might say like, how does Thursday look? I would recommend using the customer's name saying, hi, Patty, how does Thursday look? Just that would be a habit. I'd encourage you to, to practice and incorporate into your workflow, your email flow. Um, so use the customer's name, read your email aloud before sending it. Here's the thing is a typo can discredit you instantly. And I'm getting some feedback. Um, but anyways, if you, by reading your email aloud, it allows you to catch typos. And for a number, like if you're a writer or a content creator and you're sending an email to guest blog post on someone's uh, website and you have a typo in your email, that person's gonna react and say, no way, am I gonna let this this person who doesn't care about their writing and is has typos everywhere write on my website. So by reading your email aloud, you're gonna catch those typos. Filter for the four strategies, ask those four questions uh, to apply self-awareness, brevity, clarity, and positivity. Assess readability um, and ensure professionalism. So I think, okay, I think I took out a, a part there's um, using short sentence, sentences, I mentioned that before. A lot of times you'll have walls of text um, and that can make an email difficult to read or make someone hesitant to read and respond. So assess, that's what I mean by when I say assess readability. Um, I'm gonna move on just for time. Always end the email with a question. Okay, this is key. Uh, emails that contain one to three questions are 50% likelier to get replies than emails without without any questions. Um, that came from HubSpot's sales statistics this year. S the, extremely important. Um, even if it's an exam a question like, what are your thoughts? So you're making your point, you're sending your info, you, you've just written information, just ending with what are your thoughts will increase by 50% the chances of someone responding or even sound good or how's next week. Ending, ending in a question is a, a direct call to action to the person receiving the email. So highly recommend, even, even if it's a small question, to end your email with a question. So um, tactic number four, and I believe this presentation is in a handout that you can access through go to webinar, so feel free uh, to download it for reference. Follow-ups, huge for uh, s sales emails, cold emails. Like, I always ask this myself this question. I was a, a digital strategist, essentially a business development person at uh, a digital agency in Washington, D.C. The agency worked with companies like World Wildlife Fund, um, ESPN, Puma, Dick's Sporting Goods, big companies. Uh, they do, you know, hundred thousand dollar and million dollar websites. And I was a business development person, so a lot of a lot of my job was networking at events and then sending follow up e emails. And this is the rule that I followed, and it helped me land a seventy five thousand dollar deal and a thirty five thousand dollar deal. So you send an email, and the next day follow up with another email, just like circling back, hey, checking in, uh, just wanted to see if you got my email from yesterday. And then if they're, if they don't respond, um, follow up in a week, because they might be in the middle of a conference or an event, or might just be like a, a week where they get hit with a lot of projects, they just can't respond. So a week gives enough time for, you know, a new week to reset their plate and then still no response, follow up in one month. Um, for the longer projects, uh, and that kind of is a bigger reset, allows for more time uh, and for them to plan. Um, I'm getting some feedback. Okay, it went away. Number five, avoid ugly walls of text and droning sentences. Okay, this is what I was referencing before. As you write your email and you see something like this, does it make you want to read 
this wall of text? Not really. It's kind of hard on the eyes. Uh, so I would recommend breaking up. This is that same paragraph, but just broken into one sentence, many paragraphs. Make it, makes it much more accessible to start and stay interested in reading. So break up walls of text. And then I want to point something out to you because this is interesting. And in how you pace your, this is kind of a writing tip, how you pace your sentences. Uh, listen to this uh, paragraph. This sentence is five words. Here are five more words. Five word sentences are fine, but several together become monotonous. Listen to what is happening. The writing is getting boring. The sound of it drones. It's like a stuck record. The ear demands some variety. Now listen. I vary the sentence and I create music. Music. The writing sings. It has a pleasant rhythm, a lilt, a harmony. I use short sentences. And I use sentences of medium length. And sometimes when I'm certain the reader's interest is rested, I will engage him with a sentence of considerable length, a sentence that burns with energy and builds with all the impetus of a crescendo, the roll of the drums, the crash of the cymbals, sounds that say, listen to this, it is important. I love that because it's an example of how varying your sentence length, sorry for the background noise, there's a motorcycle, varying your sentence lengths can make something easier and more enjoyable to read, especially using short sentences. So um, I wanted to show you all that and to use this principle, this tactic in your emails. Avoid walls of text and vary your sentence lengths. Strengthen your writing. Use lots of periods. This is a tip from James Altucher, one of my favorite bloggers, huge podcast uh, influencer, definitely someone I recommend listening to and reading uh, from. Here's an example of something you might put in an email. Would you like to come in on Thursday the 19th as you will receive our holiday special discount because it is the Columbus Day is Columbus Day this weekend? That's a long sentence. Like it, it just goes on. So you can you can someone who's like moving quickly through emails might get lost in this question. Here's a here's a way to to break it up with lots of periods. How's Thursday the 19th work? It's Columbus Day you'd receive our holiday special discount. Just a different way of kind of breaking it up and sounding less, you know, academic. Uh, in the business world and an email, long sentences don't really help anyone. Try and keep them short, be brief. Uh, it also, I've noticed as a writer that if you can write in short sentences, it's, it's almost like a sign of confidence and strength that you don't need to, like you really know what you want to say and you can say it with few words. Um, that shows you really, that shows that you really know what you're talking about as opposed to hiding it in all sorts of ambiguous big words. Um, last one, how to write an outbound email that gets the meeting. Okay, this is going to be an example and I'm excited to show it to you. So an outbound email, this is like a cold email where it's like, I want to get a meeting with a person, a prospect, a customer, a partner, an investor. How do you write that email? Here's what's worked for me. Ask yourself, what would Dwight write? Not at all true. Uh, I just wanted to throw this picture in here to keep the office theme going. Okay, how to write an effective outbound email. Subject line. I've found that putting the person's name in the subject line uh, helps. It uh, immediately draws the eye. Also, let me back up because there's this note about check LinkedIn. Guys, if you want to say there's a company that you have in mind, let's pick one. Um, big company um, that has that you just know is established and you would really like to work with them. How do you get in touch with that person? I've what, what's worked for me is I check LinkedIn, find the person who's in charge of marketing or is a decision maker or like the person underneath the decision maker, research the company you want to work with and then put their name in, find their email, put their name in the subject line. There's different tools for finding a person's email. Um, 
maybe if someone wants to make a note, I can recommend the ones that I use to find those emails. But oftentimes it's not it's not too difficult to find someone's email. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right person to send the email to. So put their name in the headline, keep it short so that they can read it, it's not cut off. Then you say, hello name. Um, in the first sentence, keep who you are super short and get right to them. So I'm Dave and I'm going to say something about them say you or your in the first sentence. So they're, they're instantly, as opposed to saying like, I'm Dave and I'm a writer, I'm the editor of Entrepreneur's Handbook and I, uh, you know, talking about yourself or something that doesn't involve them. If you can say you or your in the first sentence, they're like, okay, this is about me. Like I need to pay attention to this because if I don't, something about me could, could happen without my input. So use you or your in the first sentence. Say something that you genuinely really like about their business in the second sentence. So if I was emailing like a, a restaurant, I bring my family twice a week to your restaurant and we love the atmosphere. And don't don't flatter, don't lie, you know, don't make something up. Like it has to be a genuine comment, like thoughtful, because there's a lot of a lot of different ways I've received emails from people who want to publish on my blog. And I can tell it's copy and pasted, like it's a template that they're sending out to other blogs. Your goal is to write something genuine that is not, doesn't sound like a template. Like it sounds like you've really thought about their business and who they are and what you like about them and like why you really want to partner or sell, you know, engage with them. Show purpose. So now that you've kind of talked through who you are, maybe you got their attention, you said something nice about their business or, or what they're doing. Their next question, the next question in the reader's mind is, why is this person reaching out to me? Like, okay, maybe I know who they are. Cool, they're on my side. Like they 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 affirm what I'm doing. Uh, so they're kind of open. Now it's like, they're suspicious of why this email is being sent. So use clear language, like I'm reaching out because or the reason I'm sending this email, like that's gonna cue them off, like, okay, here's exactly why. They're getting right to the point, not beating around the bush. They're reaching out because. Then, oftentimes in your cold email, you want them to take action, like go to your website, make a purchase, or we're, we're talking about meetings. So if you're trying to get a meeting, perhaps you're using non-intrusive language, like, Curious, I'm curious if you'd be interested in an idea I had for a partnership. It would bring new customers in the door on weekday mornings. So you're showing a benefit. Um, you're showing a benefit of why they should respond or why they should meet with you. Bring in new customers on weekday mornings. It's like, hey, I know your business doesn't, you'd like it lulls at this time during the day, I'm aware of that. So I could bring in new customers, like you're, you're thoughtful about the benefit that you're proposing. Um, saying I'm curious is such a, I don't wanna say disarming, but kind of like a softening way to ask something forward, you know? Like uh, curious, if you'd be, instead of saying, um, you should know about my idea I had for a partnership by saying, I'm curious if you'd be interested in an idea I had, it's much more uh, approachable and kind of easier to digest. So, uh, end the email with a phone call or coffee CTA, up for a quick introductory call. Introductory call, that's a great way to say like, hey, it's gonna be short, it's gonna be efficient, not gonna waste your time, let's just see if there's a fit, uh, let's, let's explore, and then be specific when you could meet with them. So. What's your Friday afternoon look like? Um, closing, looking forward to hearing from you. Let me know, thanks. Um, quick note, where's the question in this email? There, It's up for a quick introductory phone call. So we always want to, or what's your Friday afternoon look like? Always wanna have that question in there. And then saying let me know 
is or looking forward to hearing from you is indicating like I really want to like please respond uh, so here's an example to put it all together um, that I would recommend if you wanted to uh, reach out to a business owner to this would be a b2b email hi Kate it's like excitement it's their name I'm gonna move through this quickly um, Kate getting right to the it's showing like it's important you know let's not don't say hi Kate again don't want to repeat yourself I'm Dave uh, I think I'm gonna skip over this for the sake of time but this is kind of an, an example that incorporates the principles from the previous slide um, so what time is it 1243 cool um, if anyone has like a question about that, we could. I'm happy to circle back. Um, but let's talk about uh, five quick tips. Actually, let's pause for questions. I'll leave this slide up and see if anyone has a, a question. So we do have some questions. Um, we have a question from Ms. Shamika Jones about the 211 rule. Does the 211 rule apply to these introductory sales emails? And if so, what does a follow up email look like? Is it a repeat of the first? Great question. And no. Um, with a sales email, yes, you do, especially with a sales email. That's kind of what the follow up formula is, is for. Because in sales, replace the word sales with helping. So what you're emailing the prospect about is ideally, if it's a good fit and you've done your research and found a prospect who could genuinely benefit from your product or service that you're selling, they should read the email, like it will help them. And because of that, that is your reasoning and why you should follow up often. And that's why I have that formula because you really want to help this business with your product or your service. And so following up the next day or two days later, don't, um, what I do, first of all, don't repeat, don't just copy and paste and say the same thing. Um, what I do for the, the first follow up is just say like checking in, want to see if you got my email or uh, any thoughts or like, do you have an update on this language like that is what I use for that, that, that first follow up. Sorry for the siren. But the next time, like after you've waited a week or a month, they may not remember the details of the email. So you do want to do kind of like a summary rehash of that first email. Um, but here's, but what I do is I tweak it. Uh, maybe take a different angle. For example, if I'm pitching an editor for a story and I didn't hear back from them, just no response. The second, like the week later email is I'm going to maybe change the headline that I proposed or I'm going to change a detail uh, of that story because that might be more, that might catch their eye or be more aligned with what they're looking for. Um, but main point, don't, don't copy and paste and repeat. Um, because that it kind of shows that you don't value their time or that it, you don't care enough to like personalize each form of communication. So that would be my answer. Okay, great. We have another question and then maybe we'll get to the five quick tips. Um, this question is from Ms. Genevieve Jones. She wants to know, in sales is advertising my business is there a formula to presenting myself for advertising my business in sales um like in an in an email in an yeah. email yes i would like follow that's exactly what that formula was that i had before but as you present yourself introduce yourself say like hi i'm genevieve and try and get to that you statement as soon as possible like maybe not even use your last name because i mean if you're receiving a cold email like they and they don't there's been no pre-established relationship before that drop like drop your last name like that's not important at this point so just say i'm genevieve and uh 
I was on your site and I noticed or I observed this uh, piece that's missing or this thing that should be brought to your attention um, or say something like if I'm emailing an editor again to use that example it's like I saw your recent post on smart locks and I I loved how detailed you were and the clever voice that you used you know like specific thoughtful statements that pertain to them um, great way to start the email then use that language like I'm reaching out or like why are you reaching out you have to answer that question um, so be explicit um, here's an interesting thought with that sales email is um, should you put all of the information they, they need to know in that first email because sometimes I've found a cold email if you put in the in the subject line question and then in the body of the email only who's the best person to contact about this and just one sentence and your name try that uh, in different as like you can do the full sales email where it's like this is what my company does here's how we can help you and you're listing the details out that that can sometimes work but a lot of times like that comes across too salesy so to, to shorten it and be less salesy, use like that one sentence question. And I, and I guarantee, I don't guarantee, but sometimes that can help get the reply that you're looking for, or at least some sort of like engagement, so. Okay, great. So we're gonna go to the quick tips really quick and then quick tips really quick, and then do a few last minute questions and then closing. Perfect. Okay. Okay back in presenting all right quick tips so not selling we're just talking with our team and um, this is what I found as a consultant so I don't know if anyone listening or watching is a freelancer um, where you're working with clients or you're working with your team these tips will help um, have helped me develop strong customer relationships where I'm making you know hundred dollars an hour these are some of the things that have helped uh, me reach reach that level of relationship so respond as fast as possible say you're on vacation I don't want to use vacation as an example but say you're in a meeting or you're engaged you're working on something and someone responds or someone sends you an email asking for your thoughts your input often if I can't answer to like 100% to the fullest extent, I'll just respond and say, receive your email, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Like pick a time that you'll get back to them so it's they, have, they can set their expectations correctly. But instead of leaving the email open where they're wondering like, did you even see the email? Like what's going on to remove that? Just say, hey, receive your email, I'll respond in an hour, I'll respond whenever next week, whenever you can. Um, I found that to be a really helpful email communication tactic like people love when you respond quickly even if it's not a satisfactory response um, always email end your emails with clear next steps between team members like who's going to do what this can uh, this can cause some ambiguity that can frustrate especially supervisors where it's kind of like Here's what's going on and that's it you want to end the email with like okay if this is what's going on who's going to take charge what's the next steps um, I would even encourage you using those two words next steps at the end of your emails okay I wish I had a I wish I had a big photo of a sandwich for this slide but the criticism sandwich a lot of times in your emails like with your team you got to offer feedback and sometimes that feedback's not always going to be positive not always going to be uh, you know something friendly or, or, or not friendly but something that's uh, glowingly affirmative so this is this is what I recommend and what I've seen um, lead with affirmation put constructive criticism in the middle and then affirm at the end so as you're writing your email Feel free to disagree, but start with something that you like about the person or what they've done or their work. Put in your disagreement and then end with positivity or something like the way, you know, um, 
that lets folks know that it's it's not just ending with something that's oppositional. Um, so use the criticism sandwich when wanting to disagree but still be tasteful. And then I'm curious, I mentioned this before, insert, ins if you were to write an email that says like, why did you do it that way? That sounds accusatory or might come across as accusatory or too intense when you're really just wondering like, hey, what, like, why did you do it that way? And again, black and white text, it might feel like, why did you do it that way? So by, by putting, I'm curious, that, that kind of diffuses it or takes the tension off of such a direct why question. So I'm curious, why did you do it that way? Yeah, it's just a, this is a tactic that can help with uh, questioning um, in emails. Then if you have many items to discuss in a phone calls, uh, if there's no time for a phone call, um, number your ideas or points for easier and faster decision making and to kind of like paint the picture of this. If they're numbered, that and, and you're say you're interacting with the CEO or someone who's super busy, and you're and it's you're just you just need like a, a little bit of feedback. Um, this is what I do with with CEOs is I number different questions or points, and then they'll respond. What that allows them to do is respond with the numbers, and then just say yes, no, or tweak this, don't do this. Um, it just it makes multi-item emails easier. Uh, for decision makers to respond to and be fast. So they always appreciate that. Okay, folks, that's it. Um, that's what I have. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Can take more questions. I love writing and being strategic with writing and using language to accomplish goals. Um, so thanks for letting me kind of nerd out about how to write emails and happy to answer further questions. Okay, we actually do have a question really quickly from Ms. Irma Zamor Sincius. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, she wanted to know um, how can I open with negative findings? And I think you kind of answered that question in regards to the criticism sandwich. Um, but her question specifically was how can she open with negative findings that she's passionate about? Hmm. Yeah, I'd say like you kind of have to harness that, uh, that passion because passion is not always communicated accurately through email. Like, because a person could be reading that right when they wake up or when they're going to bed, like in a completely different mood than you are in, and it can get lost in the written text. So that's where the criticism sandwich really helps. Uh, despite, like, don't don't bridle your passion. Don't don't be unfaithful or untrue to what you're really feeling or what you want to say, but frame it in such a way where it can be received and not incendiary, not like inflame mm -hmm. someone to respond negatively. So yeah, use the criticism sandwich. Okay, great. I don't think we have any more questions on my end. Um, so I want to say thank you so much, Dave, for being here with us and sharing all that wisdom. I actually learned a lot from this webinar and made sure that I took notes and wrote things down. So I'm going to hand it back over to Ms. Norvell Lewis to give the closing remarks. Thank you. Hi, Paula, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ms. McCaw and Mr. Schools, uh, for helping us to craft more effective email messages. This has been one of my pet peeves, so I learned a lot, and um, I hope that all of you uh, enjoyed today's webinar as well. Again, I would like to invite you to visit our website, ncnw.org, to register for our uh, upcoming convention and to um, join us as a member. You can also find on our website uh, a presentation from today's event as well as program materials from this entire series. Um, look for us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, please take time at the end of this 
to uh, complete the survey. Your comments are very, very important to us, and they help us to determine how to make the series better. Um, we encourage you to join NCNW, where you can be fortified by the past, yet focused on the future. To find an NCNW section near you, simply go to our website and uh, look it up on the website. Uh, just another reminder that a uh, very, very important election is coming up, and uh, we hope that all of you are registered and will vote early. I think from the um, uh, events in the news today, you can see how very important it is for us to vote and to uh, share our insights and opinions. So all roads lead to November 6th. Remember to register and vote. Again, thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.